Good morning and welcome. I am Frank Shovlin. I am Professor of Irish Literature here at the University of Liverpool, and I'm delighted to welcome you to the Liverpool Literary Festival. Following on from the great success of our previous festivals, we're delighted to welcome more internationally renowned writers to the city. Please wait for our speaker to leave the hall before you do, so they can get downstairs to the Blackwell's Festival bookstall. There you can buy um, Angela's book, which she'll be delighted to sign. We'll leave time um, at the end of this event for audience questions but please wait for microphones so everyone can hear you. Um, so this morning, I'm delighted to be introducing Angela Flannery. Angela's novel, The Amusements, has been chosen by esteemed novelist and former chancellor of the University of Liverpool, Colm Tobin, as the winner of the John McGahern Prize for debut book of Irish fiction published in 2022. Writing about the book, Tobin says, Angela Flannery captures domestic scenes and intimate family dramas with an acute eye and a profound sense of sympathy. Some scenes are rendered with brilliant comic timing and gusto. In other scenes, she dramatizes the conflict between generations and between neighbors with insight and flair. She links the stories and the characters with real ingenuity so that a picture emerges not just of a small seaside town on the south coast of Ireland, but an entire society in a state of restlessness and flux. The McGahern Prize is just the latest success for the amusements. Earlier this year, it was named the Kerry Group Irish Novel of the Year 2023 and has gained widespread acclaim amongst critics. Angela is an award-winning journalist and broadcaster Having completed an MFA in creative writing at University College Dublin, her short story, Visiting Hours, was the winner of the 2019 Harper's Bazaar short story competition. In 2020 and 2021, she was awarded a literature bursary by the Arts Council of Ireland. Her work has appeared in the Bath Anthology and has been broadcast on RTE Radio 1 as part of the Frances McManus short story competition. She lives in Dublin. Now in its fourth year, the McGahern Prize was established by the University's Institute of Irish Studies to promote new Irish fiction and to celebrate the memory of one of Ireland's greatest masters of prose fiction, John McGahern. Please welcome Angela Flannery. Uh, thank you, Frank, and uh, I'd just like to say that it's, it's a huge honour for me to accept the John McGahern Prize um, in Liverpool. It was uh, a big surprise to me, and um, yeah, I was absolutely delighted. So I'd like to thank the University and uh, the Irish Studies Department and, of course, Cullum Tobin. Um, so I wrote The Amusements a number of years ago, and... Um, it is set in the seaside town of Tremor in County Waterford, which, if you're not familiar with Ireland, is probably like a little version of Blackpool. Um, not as many casinos, uh, but the same kind of vibe, so you, you, you'll get where it's coming from. So I'm going to read from the opening because it sets the scene, um, and I think it'll give you an idea of the kind of landscape that we're dealing with. Tremor, population 6,101. It was the off-season and the local youngsters were up to no good in Tip Phelan's caravan park. He wasn't about to begrudge them a few flagons in the dunes until he got a phone call from the guard the sergeant telling him a bad element was hanging around. Would you consider installing security cameras or a couple of Alsatians? That was the way with the guards. They'd make a suggestion and if you ignored it, you'd be done for tax or speeding, or any else shite. The call would have to be acted on, but you were only caught in trouble with dogs and cameras, so Tip put a small ad in the Irish Independent instead. Wanted caretaker to live rent-free by the sea. He was known as Tipperary because the only song he ever sang was Shlieve Naman. In the back room of the ground on a Saturday night, nobody would deny he had a voice. There was a want in it that could only be understood by men since it afflicted them alone. An unassailable scourge for which there was no end or cure. 
Whenever he cleared his throat to sing, I shut up the fuck, swept over the bar, hush, 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 all the way down to the lounge. Chip closed his eyes tight against the silence and began. Alone, all alone by the wave-washed strand and alone in a crowded hall. The hall it is gay and the waves they are grand, but my heart is not here at all. His real name was Michael Phelan, but nobody in Tremor, apart from his wife, Verona, knew it. She called him Tip anyway, and he called her V, or VP, when they were alone, and she gave him the look, knowing it would drive him demented. They could be at it half the night, and often they were. The next day, he'd be addled with desire and a profound ache in his bones. Early on in the marriage, when he was still hurling, he'd sleep out of temptation's way in the spare room, a measure he was forced to take after a bionic all-nighter left him in ribbons for the county final. The sentiment on the sideline was that he'd been brutal and they took him off at half time, but the match was beyond salvation. Now, V was lethal, all right. Oh, at least she had been before the twins came along. These days, she was indifferent to him. It was like living with a cat. When she wasn't changing the babies, she was nursing them, one on each nipple, their little fat legs kneading her stomach like it was dough. She was exhausted, destroyed. He begged her to patch things up with her mother for the love of God. Verona bundled her breasts back into the sling she'd taken to wearing in place of a bra and zipped her fleece up to the chin. Hell will freeze over, she said, before I talk to that bitch again. 22 people applied for the caretaker job. Tip ruled out 17 immediately on the grounds of age, criminality and Englishness. Of the five that remained, four hung up when they heard the position was unpaid. The fifth was a musician from Dublin. His accent was thicker than tar. I could do with the headspace. The payphone swallowed another 20 pence on him. Do you know what I mean? Chip knew exactly what he meant. The place is yours, he said. The musician arrived at the weekend with a hold all over his shoulder and a guitar case in one hand. The other one he extended in a handshake that was too solid to be sincere his dark eyes holding Tip's gaze for longer than was necessary. Thought he was his name, and he was idling around the 30 mark with matted brown hair and the makings of a ginger beard. He wore a hoop in one ear and a scrap of black silk knotted around his throat, an affectation that left itself dangerously open to interpretation. But he had the strut of a man who wouldn't take any lip. and They agreed if there was trouble, he was to phone Tip, and if there wasn't, he was to leave him alone. With the musician keeping an eye on the caravan park and the guards off his back, all Tip had to worry about now was getting through the next few months without the comfort of Verona. Her plan was to dedicate herself body and soul to the twins, while he took care of the older child, a boy of almost four, who tornadoed around the house, taking swiped or balled up socks with, and baby toys with a hurley that couldn't be prized from him. It was like a stick grafted onto the end of his chubby arm. He had the energy of six children and the school wouldn't take him for another year. So there was nothing for it but to run him the length of the strand until he surrendered to tiredness and fell asleep in his booster seat on the drive back home. Tip was pucking a tennis ball up and down the beach for the child the first time he saw the girl. She was walking arm in arm with the musician, her red hair aloft in the onshore wind. He watched them stride across the boulder bank in their long coats. At the dunes, the musician took the girl's hand and pulled her onto the sandbank. He held her hair between her, his fingers and kissed her face. A moment later, they vanished through a gap in the marram grass to continue their canoodling in the caravan park. Tip imagined the girl lying on the faded candlewick bedspread, her skin lilac from the cold, her hair tangled and smelling of the sea. The, child la the tide lapped its way up the shore, the child still had an hour, maybe two, of divilment in him. It was going to be a long night. He wants you to call down to the caravan. He has a form for you to sign. Verona was crouched over a towel on the living room floor, a halo of frizz around her head. She'd one baby by the ankles like a chicken and was shaking powder onto its bottom. The other baby was bouncing up and down in a contraption they'd suspended from the door frame. What kind of a form? She handed him the rolled up nappy. He didn't say. Social welfare. Verona fastened the buttons on the baby grow and sighed, and well, I suppose he has to live on something. Her breasts were loose beneath the peach pyjama top that had the words sweet dreams printed in silver across the front. He wondered what would happen if he touched her now. Would it hurt her? 
would her milk seep out? And if it did, what would he feel? Arousal? Shame? On the towel, the baby wriggled her arms and legs. She rolled over onto her front and scuttled across the floor. Tip? Yes, love. Do me a favour, make sure you pick up all the Lego after you. I'm sick of standing on bits. The babies could choke on it. The nappy felt heavy in his hand. He gave the plastic a gentle squeeze. I'm not getting at you, she said. I know that. He walked into the kitchen and threw the nappy in the bin. Thank you. Thanks very much, Angela. Um, I wondered um, if you could say a little bit more about Tremore and your reason for choosing it. The characters um, have, have very mixed views about it. Uh, in, in, in one of the chapters, the fear, the main character calls it the darkest hole in Ireland. And uh, I, wonder, <laughs> I wondered, is it the darkest hole in Ireland and why you chose it? Yeah, there's a very long list for that title, I think, The Darkest Hole in Ireland. No, I chose Tremor because um, about eight years ago, I read a short story by William Trevor called Honeymoon in Tremor. And it really just had a huge impact on me. I was born in Waterford, so I know Tremor quite well, but I didn't grow up there, you know. And um, in this short story, uh, a boy is taken in as a farmhand. He's... he's um, in an orphanage in Cork and he's taken in by this family and he grows up fall after falling in love with the farmer's daughter and they don't really have that much respect for him or regard for him but then when the farmer's daughter um, finds herself in trouble they need somebody to take responsibility and so Davy Toome the farmhand is um, you know it, basically he's going to marry her even though he wasn't the one responsible and uh, so he's cuckolded into this but they go on their honeymoon in Tremor and the description that Trevor gives of Tremor, it just was so funny. And, you know, Trevor isn't normally a humorous writer, but there's something very, very surreal about it. And it occurred to me that I had never actually read anything else that was set in Tremor. And, you know, for these Victorian seaside towns, they're so giving, they're so visual. So much is happening there. So many people come and go. And I thought, why has nobody written about this? I'm going to try and write a Tremor story. And so I did that, and um, it was the first story that I published. It was published in the Bath Anthology. It's called The Court Order, and it has nothing whatsoever to do with the amusements. But I suppose I just felt, oh, I thought, you know, it came quite easily to me, and I wanted to write more. I felt like I'd just scratched the surface of Tremor. And so then I wrote um, the, or the Visiting Hours, which actually appears as St. Otterin's in the amusements. So it was the origin story for the novel. And that tells the story of Helen, who's the heroine of the amusements. But that story won the Harper's Bazaar Prize. And so I thought, oh, I'm onto something here. Because at the time, I was struggling with a novel that I'd written, but just wasn't working. You know, and I just put it away, and I kept writing Tremor. And that's how it came about, you know. So, but it, it, it's a matter of place. I think it lodged itself in my imagination as a child. And when my father died, my mother moved down to Tremor. She's not from there, but it was somewhere that she had great memories of because she would have gone to dance halls there when she was in her teens. And it was somewhere she, you know, that she was very happy. And so she moved there. So in her 30s and 40s, myself and my siblings have gone there with our children and they've had that early childhood experience there. So it just spoke to me. Something about it lodged in me as a place. And it was very easy for me to walk around there, you know, and imagine lives. And that's really what the amusement is, imagined lives in this place. Um, your professional background is in journalism, mm -hmm. and I wondered if you would say a little bit about the difference between writing fiction and writing journalism, and whether you think that being a journalist was of a help to you as a fiction writer. Mm. So I was unusual in that I worked in broadcast news, um, and I worked in print. So not that many people get to cross over between print and broadcast. So in broadcast news, you know, really you're just, you're writing bulletins, you're making editorial decisions all the time, and you never take your work home with you. Whereas when I worked in features, I was a columnist and a reviewer, and I was always, it was very much like creative writing and that you lived with it, you went for walks with your column, you took showers with your column, and so that, but you had to meet your deadline. So it was really, really good creative practice. But what was interesting was I found that news 
really helped me when it came to editing because I tend to, a lot of writers write very long and then they have to go through it and extract the story from all of the bump that's around it. I, because I think I've worked as a journalist, I can't actually go down to the next page if I'm really not happy about the paragraphs that precede it. So I tend to write short and I'd be quite a brutal self-editor, which is, you know, and I think that does come from being, particularly having to write radio news because you have to read your story and you know, 30 seconds and then on to the next one. So I think my ability to prioritize and edit and write short and uh, like to really have an intolerance for purple prose, because of course you can't have that. Um, you, you know, an image will stick with you uh, much faster than a stream of adjectives or adverbs. So technically it did help me. What was interesting though with this is that there's a character in this, Maggie Crow, who's the host of the Early Bird Show on the local radio station. Now, I never worked in, in local radio, I worked in national radio for Today FM, it's the biggest national commercial station in Ireland. And, um, but Maggie Crow came to me fully formed. She was so easy to write. And I'd know, I, you know, I didn't go in thinking I'm going to write a character, but anytime anyone turns on a radio, that's how Maggie appears. She, you know, you don't meet her in person, it's just when people, because I really love radio so much that I feel that radio hosts do become friends. They're in your kitchen, they're in your car, you're spending all this time. So Maggie Crow was a character that I definitely got from my experience as working as a journalist. So it has helped, yeah, yeah. And how did that, how did the decision for you to try to write fiction come about? Have you always been writing fiction? You know, with, you, you mentioned a novel that just didn't work. Um, there must have been a moment where you thought, I need to try and do this, um, or, or I'm going to stay as a journalist. Well, there's nothing wrong with staying as a journalist, but you know... But there's what, plenty wrong with it. Why, <laughs> why that moment? What happened? Um, well, like I said, I really... You know, my, my, when I was writing reviews, I was writing columns, I really had an awful lot of poetic license. My editors in the Irish Independent gave me enough rope to hang myself with, put it that way. But it became very frustrating because there were things I wanted to write. It is much easier to tell the truth in fiction because nobody's going to sue you for a start, you know. So there really is, um, yeah, I find, I just find fiction more truthful. So there was a column that I was writing and it was about um, stranger danger, really was what it was about. Uh, but very often as a columnist, you refer back to your own life. And I remember my editor saying to me, I'm very surprised at you because there's something in here that through jigsaw identification and the solicitor who would normally legal the paper just said it would take you three seconds to identify the person that's in this. And it did take me three seconds to actually find them when I went looking, you know. So I thought I can't write, this will have to take the form of fiction. Now I still haven't used the scenario that I was talking about, but at some stage I expect, because everything is in there. You know, and it's amazing. That's the mystery of creative writing, the magic of it. When it comes out, the form it takes and the character and how it morphs into something else. So at that moment, I thought if I wanted to write about this, really fiction. But for years, I've been secretly writing um, bits of short stories, introductions to novels. I mean, I'd written poetry as a teenager, as most teenagers do, you know. But I did find that my journalism career, and I was teaching journalism as well, it was so all consuming and I had a young child. I just didn't have time. So I kind of thought once I got into my mid forties, I am not going to do this. Like if I don't get it done by the time I'm 50, then it's not going to happen. And I won the journalist, magazine journalist of the year for essays. And they were personal essays, short personal essays I'd written for Image magazine, the women's magazine. And the comments, I can't remember the exact comment of the judges, but it was around openings and fiction, not fiction, but imagery. And I thought, that's what I want to do, like I really want to do this. So I started taking all of the stuff that I'd privately written and entering it into competitions. Oh no, I did a writing course and then I entered the novel fair in the Irish Writers' Centre with the novel that is currently under a floorboard, hammered nails into it, it's never coming out again, you know. Um, but so that was, that was one of the winners of the novel fair and that gave me the confidence to kind of go, okay, I, um, I will put myself out there. But I entered competitions anonymously with, you know, that were anonymous in the sense that they were red blind. So I didn't want it, I didn't want, I mean, not that I had a high profile as a journalist, but I just wanted to know that this was because it was chosen, you know, from all of the entries and nobody, you know, knew anything about it. And that, 
I, I guess I just needed that, that for my self-confidence. Because, you know, I think all writers have imposter syndrome, and I definitely had it. I really had it very severely. I felt I was a journalist, not a, not a writer, and that there was... A de but, I mean, the irony is, is that I always wanted to be a writer, but I didn't know what a writer was. I didn't grow up around writers, you know? And once I knew what a journalist was, I was like, oh, that's what I want to be. And it was a dream come true for me, you know, um, to do that. I loved my job, you know, and, but it was a way of writing. One, one of the things that John McGahern says about writing that I like a lot, is he says that the strangest thing about writing is that you never learn how to do it. And every time that you yeah, sit at the screen or the, the page, you're beginning again. Um, I wondered, I'm sure there are people in the audience who, um, who are writers or who have ambitions to write. Mm -hmm. I wonder, could you say a little bit about the actual business of getting this book published? How did, how did that happen? You know, who published it? Yeah. Agents, that sort of thing. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, w after the novel fair, it was enough to get me into an MFA in creative writing in UCG. And very fortunately for me, one of my, you know, writing heroes is Anne Enright, and she's the professor of creating, creative writing in UCG. And um, all of the teachers there were magnificent. And it's a really small uh, class, an MFA. There was only five of us in it. And we were very close and very competitive in a very good way, like almost like team players, where if you, you, you didn't come in with good work, you were kind of letting the side down a bit. And we were, you know, and we're still friends and we're supportive to each other, but that was amazing over a year to do that. And I think it was so well respected that, you know, at the end of it, we all, um, you know, knew what we were doing. We were a bit older as well. So it was like, okay, we want to get agents and we want our agents to send our books out. So I suppose it is just about familiarizing yourself with those steps and the order they should happen in, you know? So I was um, about to look for an agent. I was sending um, my manuscript out uh, early on in COVID and I'd entered the Deborah Rogers Foundation competition, which is a competition, I can't, Exactly. Well, it's for an unpublished writer and you get mentorship and you may, you'll be introduced to publishers and agents and there's money with it. It gives you time to complete your first piece of fiction, your first collection of short stories or a novel. I can't remember which it was, but I wasn't long listed and I wasn't shortlisted and my manuscript was in the bin and one of the judges picked it out because she liked it and rang me just before my 50th birthday in lockdown where I was going, oh, mother of God, what am I actually doing? Like, I'm sitting here looking at this teenager and I've no job and it's Armageddon and I'm 50. Jesus, how did this happen, you know? And she said, do you have a whole book? And I said, yes, yes, I do, I do, would you read it? And she said, like, yes. And I, she said, look, it could take me a couple of months, but she got back to me within 48 hours and said, we'd like to sign you. And it was just amazing, Frank. I mean, it was really, and she was, I mean, I, I, yeah, I have a great agent and she really put me through the paces and we kicked it into shape over COVID. And then eventually um, Penguin Ireland uh, bought it. And that's what happened, which was, is great because my editor's in Dublin, but it's a big recognized publisher. So I've been, I've been incredibly lucky. It was a long road, but I think tenacity is what gets you there. You just can't give up. And the same, and I mean, it, it's done really well, but you have to go back to the desk. And now there's the difficult second album, you know? So it is, yes, McGarren was absolutely right. You're learning every single time, you know? Um, but, so that was the process for me. Everyone is different. But for me, getting an agent was a really, really big deal because I wouldn't, the business side of it, I didn't, you know, I really didn't want to be distracted. I really wanted to just lose myself in the world and my characters, you know, and that was my job. You mentioned that the, the St. Otterns chapter began yeah. life as a short story. Mm. When did you know that this was going to be a novel and not a collection of short stories? Um, it just kept getting bigger. Once I realized it was about a community, I thought all of these, like, you know, I love short stories, but you can't be having characters wandering into short stories and sitting down and doing nothing. And then the story's over. What's that person doing there? You know, um, Chekhov's gun, isn't that it? Has to be used, has to go off. Uh, so I realized once they started appearing in each other's stories that this was a novel and that it was going to be a composite and it was going to be polyphonic and it was going to be incredibly complicated because even though it doesn't have the typical, you know, like I, 
Look, I have, with all due respect to Aristotle, I do believe that we need structure in fiction, like absolutely, you need a narrative. Um, but this to me was more modernist and I would really have looked towards Elizabeth Strout, who's a huge influence on me. And Anne Enright has done it in The Green Road as well. Donal Ryan actually does it, where you, it's character driven. And so people's, it's this codependency when you're writing about a community. It seemed like the perfect shape to me so I guess it can be read if people want to as a collection of short stories, but I feel like it's a very weak collection of short stories because they don't stand alone. So that was it when they started walking in and out. But then there was the decision of how do you put them into an order where it makes sense? Because of course there has to be. Um, it was really important to me that there was some kind of pathos that the, the baddies get their comeuppance. You know, that I wanted a sense of natural justice. So there has to be that rising action. Like it had to be there. So to sew that in, it was like knitting an iron jumper is the way that I've described it because I realized when I put it all together that I'd started dropping stitches at the beginning and they had to be brought the whole way up and all the threads. So I had all these Venn diagrams intersecting to see who was, you know, how, how much did it follow through, how much interaction was there between the characters. And I just couldn't keep track. So I painted a wall in my kitchen with blackboard paint, you know, and, method writing and I, I'd be there with chalk just writing all over it and you know my brother used to arrive he's um he's a plumbing business so he'd be up and down to Dublin all the time and he'd come in for his cup of coffee and he'd sit there and he'd go who's that person now and I'd say it's not our family no you know he'd like ah no no who is it and we're all in for it aren't we you know because you could see it was set in Tremor my mother was living there so he was utterly convinced you know and then he'd be like am I in it <laughs> so. it, it's a very complex book, um, and that's, that's not in any way to put you off reading it, but it really requires rereading. Um, all, all books benefit from rereading, but this book, there, there will be characters that you, you've met, say, on page six, and then there's a, a sort of echo of them on page 105, and you're thinking, now, who's that again now, and how, how does he fit into this story? Um, so I can see it exactly, uh, and when you first told me that story about the blackboard paint, I, I loved it, the idea that, because it, it's, even though it's, you know, a short book, there, it is very complex, the way that your, your characters marry up, and I think that, that's one of its, one of its great strengths. Um, you mentioned uh, a couple of people who, who've influenced you. Um, what other writers do you admire, or is there one book that had more influence on you than, than any other? I think probably um, My Name is Lucy Barton. Actually, all of Elizabeth Stroud's books. I just love the idea that your characters, she can't get them out of her head. Lucy Barton will not leave her head, you know? And I mean, like the excitement I felt when I opened Lucy by the Sea and they're escaping from um, New York during the pandemic and where do they go to? They go to Crosby, Maine and Olive Kitteridge lives there and I was like oh my god her two big characters are about to intersect and I think that's the influence of me because I just feel that they're you know I couldn't tell you whether the characters in this are going to reappear I kind of hope they do it happens a lot in Donald Ryan's work as well actually but I feel that the characters stay with you they're, they you know they really did become real people to me so I would say that probably Elizabeth Strout would be the biggest influence on me yeah for that reason yeah. one of the one of the chapters is set in New York mm. um, and uh, I believe you lived there for for a period is that, is that a part of your life that you, you could see yourself wanting to write about again in future, future fiction? Definitely, yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, I think it's about place. And I don't know, is it peculiar to, I don't think it is peculiar to Irish writers, but you know, I mean, we've spoken about this when the previous winners of the McGahern Prize, Adrian Duncan, I've spoken to him about place, and he says he hasn't, even though he lives in Berlin, he's written about all sorts of places, that actually in his head, he really hasn't left, you know, his parents' bungalow and garden. And when he looks at this aerial photograph taken of the bungalow, every theme from his work is there in that aerial photograph from the goalposts to the rick of turf to, you know, his father's office. But I mean, McGahern, you know, it's a stretch of road in Leitrim, it's, you know, I mean, Albeit that, you know, Donald Ryan is, I don't know, it's Nina he's writing about basically, but he just doesn't call it Nina in County Tipperary. And so to me, we moved a lot, but Tremor is one place, New York is another, and um, Portobello in Dublin, 
and around the canal in Dublin and the south of the city is another, that that is where my imagination plays. And parts of Kilkenny, where my mother is from. So New York, definitely. And I mean, the chapter that's in New York, that's the only one that's close to biographical because I did work in a bar that was like that bar in New York. And that did happen to me, what happens in that story. You know, but it's not entirely, obviously I've embellished and there was no, there's an accident, car accident at the end of it, that didn't happen. But the bar was a real place, yeah, it was. A lot of critics um, in, in reviewing the book, and it's very plain to me when I read it, comment on the, the comic aspects of it. Mm. Um, are you deliberately writing comedy? Do you, know, do you get up in the morning saying, I'm going to write comedy, or does that just happen as part of the natural process of getting, to, getting the characters to do what you want them to do in the places you want them to do it? I don't think about it. I don't go, I'm going to be funny today, because that would be the least funny thing in the world. So, no, it just, um, I think I developed humour through my column writing, actually. I wrote a restaurant column that was all for about 12 years. And there was always humor in that. And I think that there, there was just a voice in it that came to, you know, I, I feel that you, I feel an obligation to be entertaining to people if they buy a book, you know, that I want them. Like it, yes, it is complex, but it doesn't have to be. You can read it without knowing. And if you, you know, there's, there's little, it's like there's little hidden treats in there if you can pick up on the threads. But the humor is also there because there's a lot of sadness and a lot of darkness in this. So it's gallows humor, which maybe comes from working in a newsroom. I don't know, but that's the type of humor that I have. No, it's not from that. My whole family have it, actually. You know, very dark, dark, but humorous. Um, yeah, so that's, but I don't, I don't ever plan it. But I do think, I do believe in, um, you know, lightness and shade. I absolutely think that it's necessary in storytelling, always. You know, it's, uh, it's what I like to read, but I, I just, for, from the reader's point of view, that it needs to, and if you didn't, it is the old, if you didn't laugh, you'd, you'd cry. I'll just ask you one more question before I, I take some questions from the audience, which is, I know that you have um, associations with the north of England yeah. on both your mum's and your dad's yeah. side, and we were chatting a bit about your, your love of the Smiths, for instance. Mm. Um, uh, could you say a little bit about that, about since we're here in the north of England, uh, about that part of, of your makeup and how that maybe, you know, uh, influences you? Well, if my father thought that I was sitting here accepting an award, I mean, my life would be hell, he'd be boasting. He was from um, just outside Wigan. So there are more Flannerys in the north of England than there are in all of Ireland. Like there really are. If you go in and do one of those ancestry, you look in and you know it goes red or where all the people, I mean, it's all in this area. So my mother uh, trained as a nurse here. So she would have come here at 17 on the cattle boat into Birkenhead. And she did her training in Cleaver Hospital and in Alderhay and met my father who uh, is from Lowton. So just outside Wigan. And they got married here and my brother was born here. And then I don't think my mom was pregnant with me at the time, but I was, I was on the way, you know, and um, they left and moved to Ireland, which was kind of reversed. I mean, everyone was coming this way, you know, so they went there. And I think it was because, I mean, my father's family were minors and my father did not want to be a minor and he'd gone, they'd opened the trade colleges. So he had gone to Bolton Tech and he was a plumber. So he had his trade or that's like my birth cert says central heating installer, because that was like really posh, you know, you were, you were, so that was what he did. But, you know, and you could, you, you know, this belief that you have a trade, now you can travel. Whereas coal mining, even he could see, was a very intelligent man, very astute. He could see the direction that that was going. And his younger brothers did work in the mines and one of them afterwards went to South Africa because that was, you know, they were miners, that's what they did. So um, he went to Ireland and he never, he, it was like, and you know, when we were in school in Ireland, it's like the Normans were more Irish than the Irish themselves is what they'd say. My father was more Irish than the Irish themselves. He played rugby league, but there was no rugby league in Ireland. So he got in with the GAA. So they, he had to get them to accept this Englishman. And, you know, um, he was obsessed with hurling. My mother's from South Kilkenny. So that was his thing. It just became, um, so he, I mean, he died when he was my age and his funeral, he had the GAA, like the colours for the local club over his casket and the Hurleys over it. You know, I mean, amazing. Yeah. So, but his, he would have been in the GAA club boasting like you would not believe, or down the union if he was here, that's where he would have been. 
boasting about this. So it's kind of incredible. Yeah, so I do, I'm strong. All, all that side of my family still live here around Wigan and Lothen, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's um, if any of you have ever played hurling, uh, it's a fiendishly difficult game. So for a rugby league man to arrive in Ireland and take off hurling is pr pretty Well, to pretty, be accepted by the GAA as well yeah. as an Englishman, you know, because even though he's an Irish name, our family have been here for hundreds of years. I did not identify as being Irish. You know, my grandmother had um, a cabinet full of dolls. That's what she, she collected them, but they were all the wives of Henry VIII. Like, this is like the 70s and 80s, where I think it was Marshall Cavendish. She was sent away for all of the, you know, so, but it was all royalty. Like, she really was a loyalist, you know. It was very much, so they didn't, you know, they didn't identify particularly as Irish, but he absolutely loved Ireland, you know, adored it, yeah. Um, I think we can take some questions from the audience if anyone would like to uh, ask Angela a question. Yes, uh, the, a mic will come down to you. So just this gentleman in the front row, please. Was there a particular attraction about setting it in a, a seaside, a, a coastal town? Um, I come from a coastal town myself, so I was just curious, really, why, why, why this particular setting? Yeah. Yeah, I love seaside towns. And I mean, these, actually, they were modeled on English seaside towns, as, uh, you know, probably a half a dozen that come to mind in Ireland of Victorian seaside towns. And they were originally, and it's in the book, you know, I did try to weave a lot of the history of the town into the book, that they were originally um, sort of health spas for Victorians, where you went if you had asthma or bronchitis or anything like that to take the salt water. And that, so I tried to get that history in as well. Mm -hmm. And I love how seaside towns, they have to kind of reinvent themselves every generation. So there would have been dance halls and show bands and all of that going on in the 50s and 60s there. And I think that's probably mirrored here that they've, I mean, I know like having read Tracy Emmons' um, memoir about growing up um, in, oh gosh, what's the name of the place that she grew up in? Am I gonna forget it? Margate, yeah, Strangeland, I think it's called. And I kind of thought, wow, that really does sound like, you know, the old crumbling Victorian terraces and, they're, you know, the sort of, uh, the, oh, there's a squalor when that starts falling apart. And I, that's really attractive to me. You know, just those two things, cheek by jowl, you know, the history and the modernity. And there's snobbery around them as well, you know, because there was a lot of snobbery around Tremor, you know, around, oh, well, it's where the working class go. Um, What's intriguing to me about seaside towns, and because I know because my mother lives there now, is that they have this whole other life, which is called the top town in the book, that happens away from the prom and the amusement park where people live. And I see them as very theatrical. You know, that what, who are all those players? What goes on when you pull away the rigging and pull the curtain back and it's off season? What is the, what's happening in, those, in their lives? And what footprint have the tourists who come? What, what, what footprint have they left on their lives? So I absolutely um, chose it because it's a seaside town. It was the most attractive thing about it. So yeah, I did. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Any other questions? There's one just right here, yeah. If you just wait for the mic, thanks. Thanks, Angela, and a wonderful reading as well. Thank you for sharing that with us. What form does research take for a book with such mighty consequences as the amusements? It sounds fantastic when you talk about the New York bar. There's so much more to it than that. How do you go about researching a book like that? Do you know, I, um, I think I'm addicted to Google Earth. Like, I live on Google Earth. <laughs> And looking at, at different times of the year and, you know, to see what does it actually look like at this time of the year? Is it that accurate? I mean, I think actually that being a journalist, being a news journalist really helped me where I'm obsessed with details uh, to make sure that they're, they're accurate. And Anne Enright, you know, talk about a good teacher. I remember in um, St. Otterans when Helen is taking the bus from Tremor into Waterford, I had, a, I think I said the bus grumbled or rumbled beneath her. And I was workshopping that with Anne, and she said, mm, what kind of a bus was it? I was like, a public bus? And she said, no, what make was it? And I said, I don't know, what year was it? What kind of engine was in it? Is that the sound that engine would make? And I was like, oh my God, she's, you know, but she's right. 
She's absolutely right. So that's the level you end up, my, my search history, like, yeah, it would get me arrested, definitely. But there's just crazy stuff in it, you know? And so I, it makes me wonder, how did people write books before there was the internet? And I just think they're probably just not very accurate. <laughs> you know? Um, but yeah, so that's how I do it. I just read so anything that I'm not 100% sure of. And even then, I, I just check everything. I just check absolutely everything. The one thing um, that came back to me, because I was always wondering, you know, um, the butcher in it, Ted, Tadius Burke, the butcher. He, I was inspired by a friend of mine whose father is a butcher, but she said to me, he was, you know, daddy was very erudite, she'd say to me. I never met him. He sounds like a great character, five daughters, all very feisty, artsy Irish women. And I just thought I would love to meet this guy. You know, he was um, a bon vivant by her account and really into theatre and books and all of that. So I thought, right, that sounds like a good character. It's not based on the man, but I just, that was the start of the idea. So I was writing Ted and all of that. So, I mean, the chapter with Ted in it, I love because it's an older man in his 70s who finds love again. And he's fallen in love with one of his customers and he pursues her around the town. But um, I kind of thought, well, there couldn't be that much to being a butcher. I couldn't really, you know, everyone's been in a butcher's shop. And I was having work done in my house during the summer. And the guy who was doing the building was actually a butcher by trade. And he said to me, oh yeah, I read your book, yeah, yeah, yeah. And he said, it was great. Yeah, you got the butcher in there. And I was like, yeah, I love him. And I told him the story. And he said, ah, yeah, but you know, like, I, do you mind me saying, it just was, wasn't really accurate. And I was like, what could possibly be wrong? And he was so right. Ted at one point puts on a polythene glove to take meat out of a tray. And Brian, my builder, said to me, no, you just put your hand in the bag and you scoop it out and then you turn the bag in, which is exactly what you do. And I've seen that motion so many times. And I just felt really disappointed in myself for not <laughs> kind of spotting it. So you'll, there'll always be something. And that's your fear is that you don't know who's going to read it and how inauthentic it's going to sound because that just would not happen. You know? So, yeah. Any other questions? Yes, just right, Mike's there. Thank you. We loved it. Um, <clears throat> after I, I'd read it, I felt it was a bit of a social commentary, even though it is a fiction. But quite often, if you read a social commentary, there is a reason for it being done, and there's a judgment comes through in, 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 in the characters or what's been seen but I didn't feel any of that coming through in your book. How hard was it to write about people and not make any sort of judgment about them? I was thinking particularly, I can't remember the names now, but um, the lady who has to go back several times to get the grant, and it was all kind of being arranged behind closed doors, the grant to carry on with her business when her husband had died. You know, that sort of setup seemed a little bit corrupt to me, but you didn't come over in any way judgmental yeah. about it. Well, I, I, I try not to be judgmental, but you're right. I mean, there is a social commentary in there. I mean, really, it's a book about class. It's about love and class and community. And, you know, that it isn't an even playing field for somebody like Helen, the heroine, and she wants to be a fine artist, but comes from a working class family. But I don't, um, I don't want to pontificate, and I want to do it lightly, and it probably is quite hard to do. But yeah, I'm not, um, I'd hate to be thought of as a pedantic writer in any way, because, you know, people make up their own minds. My job is to get them to the point where they agree with me and make them think it was their idea in the first place, I suppose. I don't know. But I don't like, um, yeah, I, I don't want to beat people over the head with politics, but there is, you know, Government policies trickle down and they have an effect on the everyday lives of people and that's what I wanted to do without ever talking about particular policies or particular politics. Um, I just wanted to look at how people live the reality of, yeah, of, of government failures. Yeah. Um, on, that, on that issue, um, the, the book that won the McGarham Prize last year, which was Louise Kennedy's The End of the World as a Cul-de-Sac, mm -hmm. is, is very good on the, um, the way that Ireland um, experienced economic collapse after the so-called Celtic Tiger years in yeah. uh, 2008. And um, 
I'm going to spring this on you. We didn't agree to this, but I wonder, would you mind reading just the opening of the fear, um, yeah. which yeah. is a, which is I think uh, partly a, a comment on that moment in in Irish history, recent Irish history, which felt it felt like we came very close to collapsing altogether as as a country, um, and it's told from the point of view of uh, a public health nurse. But I'll say no more and let uh, let Angela just read a little bit of of the chapter, the fear. Yeah, you're right. It is probably the one that's most like Louise's. Um, Louise's short stories in the end of the world is a cul-de-sac a brilliant collection get it after you get this of course um, <laughs> the fear Jenny liked to get some air before her afternoon house calls most Tuesdays she'd drive down to the prom for lunch at Caruso's where she'd sit at an outside table with a good view of the beach she liked to watch the kite surfers admire the fuck you rhythm of their boards skipping across the water no matter how hard she squinted, she never could make out the strings that bound them to their kites. Every time they caught a gust of wind, she felt her heart soar at the fluorescent yellow slash marks they made across the sky. But today was a windless sort of day. There wouldn't be any kite surfers. The sky hung dull as pewter above the bay, and the sea had a grief-stricken look that she wasn't able for. It wouldn't have taken much to pull her under, not with the head she'd on her. They were breeding like rabbits in the new estates beyond the race course, and she was flat out, haranguing first-time mothers about the benefits of breastfeeding, making sure they were getting their babies to latch on, and that they didn't have mastitis. Jenny was one of two public health nurses assigned to Tremor. The other one, Mary Dunphy, was on compassionate leave for an undisclosed illness that everyone presumed to be her nerves. It was, a, it was hard to be sympathetic. With the way things were, who wasn't suffering, the government had bailed out the banks, and now there was no money for anything, not even incontinence pads for her old and handicapped clients. When Jenny turned on the news, she was confronted by a government minister shaking his well-fed head and telling the country it had lost the run of itself. His stupidity and extravagance would cost us dearly for generations to come. But to remember, and to be thankful, that this was Ireland, not Greece. Greece was fucked. <laughs> what good was all of that civilization? when they were up Shit Creek without a paddle. Jenny wasn't so sure. The Greek finance minister was too handsome for politics. He drove around European summits on a gleaming motorbike, forever giving the IMF the finger. His name was Yanis. It had a strong, sexy ring to it, and Jenny liked his style. Besides, what had those beaky IMF shite hawks ever done for her? Except cut her pay and slap a recruitment ban on the health service, which meant she now had to cover Mad Mary's home visits on top of her own. And the upshot, if your postpartum fanny was healing too slowly or your mind had wandered up to the metal man to consider the pros and cons of throwing your body off the cliffs, public health nurse Jenny Supple had neither the time nor the patience to deal with your untreatable complaints. In fact, they weren't worth putting the cost of diesel in her 05 Ford Fiesta. Thanks very much, Angela. That's, that was terrific. Um, I'm going to have to draw uh, the event to a close so that uh, we have time for the book signing afterwards. Um, I can't recommend the book highly enough. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a terrific read, and um, it's, it's, uh, it's a great privilege for us at the Institute of Irish Studies and at the University of Liverpool to, to be associated with you know, fiction of this quality. And, uh, you know, we hope that we will be able to continue to sponsor the prize in, in the years to come. Um, there are a number of other events still to come over uh, today and tomorrow in the festival, and there are tickets available if you'd like to make inquiries downstairs. And we would be delighted to see you at future events. So thank you very much, and thank you, Angela. <laughs>